I came into this world not with a cheer, but a burden. My mother, Elizabeth, wasn't ready for me, or maybe she just never wanted to be. It's hard to tell the difference when you're the unwanted one. From my first breath, I was more a problem than a person in her eyes. You never stop crying, do you? She would hiss, during those long nights of my infancy. Her voice was often laced with irritation, lacking the gentle touch you'd expect from a mother. My father, Michael, was different. He was the one who stepped up, trading sleep for soothing walks with me in his arms, while my mother locked herself away in silence. Let me take her, Liz, I remember him pleading one night, his voice as soft as the blankets he wrapped me in. You need to rest. As I grew, the gap between my mother's affection and indifference widened, especially when Emily was born. Suddenly, there was light in my mother's eyes, but it wasn't for me. Look at her, Michael. She's perfect, mom cooed over Emily, something I never heard directed at me. The differences were stark. While Emily slept quietly in her arms, I was often left playing alone or trying to help around the house. Why don't you be a good big sister and play quietly, hmm? Emily is sleeping. Mom would often chide when my footsteps or small voice crept a decibel too high. My role in the house grew as I got older. I wasn't just the elder sister, I was the helper, the cook, the cleaner, whatever kept me busy and out of the way. As time went on, I learned the art of invisibility at home. It was easier to blend into the background, to anticipate needs before they were spoken. By the time high school rolled around, I was more the family caretaker than their child. Anna, make sure the laundry's done and dinner's ready by six, mom would command as she left with Emily for another shopping trip, their laughter a bitter sound as it faded down the hallway. Yes, mom, was always my reply, mechanical, rehearsed. At school, things were different. I was a good student, quiet, but diligent. Teachers noticed me, praised me, something that never happened at home. They encouraged me, talked about potential and futures that seemed so distant from my reality. Have you thought about college, Anna? Mr. Henderson, my English teacher, once asked. His encouragement felt like a lifeline. I'd like to, sir. I really would. I admitted, a flicker of hope stirring within. Those moments, rare and precious, were what fueled me. They made the long days and lonely nights bearable. They whispered of a life beyond the confines of my mother's cold indifference and the shadow of my sister's favored existence. A life where maybe, just maybe, I could be seen for who I was, not just for what I could do for others. By the time I graduated high school, I had my plan all mapped out. It wasn't anything fancy, just a simple escape from a home that felt more like a prison. The day I turned 18, I packed my bags, mostly filled with second-hand clothes and a few cherished books. You really going through with this? Dad asked, his face lined with worry as he watched me stuff a duffel bag. Your mom's gonna flip, you know. She expects you to stick around, help out with the house, with Emily. I zipped up the bag with more force than necessary. I know, but I can't stay here, Dad. I gotta try and make something of myself. I moved into a tiny apartment on the edge of town, close enough to my new job at a local diner. The work was hard and the hours were long, but every paycheck was a step closer to my goal. The diner was a noisy, bustling place, filled with the clatter of dishes and the constant chatter of customers. I learned to keep my head down and my hands busy. Nights were spent in a cramped study corner of my apartment, textbooks spread out as I worked through community college applications. I was determined to be more than a waitress, more than what my mother said I'd be. Why you both Aaron with all that school stuff? My neighbor, Joe, once asked when she caught me buried in paperwork. Ain't like it's gonna change much. It might not, I admitted, but it's worth a shot. I want to be a teacher, Joe. I want to do something, meaningful." Joe snorted, dragging on her cigarette. Well, good luck with that, kid. This world ain't kind to dreamers. Saving money became a game of numbers. Every tip went into a jar, every spare dollar tucked away for future tuition. I cut corners everywhere, lived on ramen and toast, and kept my eyes on the prize.
After a year of relentless work and study, I had enough to enroll in college. I chose the local community college, affordable and within commuting distance. The day I received my acceptance letter, I felt a surge of pride like never before. Walking into my first class, I felt out of place with my worn-out jeans and second-hand textbooks, but I was there, in a seat, ready to learn. You here for the early childhood education program? A girl next to me asked, her pen tapping nervously on her notebook. I'm Sarah. We should study together, maybe? Sure, Sarah. I'm Anna. I'd like that. College was a whole new world, one where I wasn't just the forgotten daughter or the hard-working waitress. I was a student, a peer, and soon, I found myself part of a community. Evenings were still spent at the diner, but now my days were filled with lectures, group projects, and a growing belief that I could really make this happen. I could become someone who made a difference. The path wasn't easy. There were moments of doubt, of fear that maybe Joe was right, that maybe the world wasn't kind to dreamers. But every time I helped a classmate understand a tough concept, or received praise from a professor, I knew I was where I was supposed to be. By the time my second year of college rolled around, I was deep into my studies and working the evening shift at the diner. One evening, as I balanced a tray full of burgers and shakes, my phone buzzed in my apron. It was an email from the college financial office. My heart skipped, this was it, the scholarship decision. I waited until my break, hands shaking as I logged in to read the email. Congratulations, it began, we are pleased to inform you. I didn't need to read the rest, I had done it. A full ride for the next year. I let out a breath I didn't even know I was holding and slid down against the wall, relief washing over me. The following weeks flew by in a blur of exams and late-night shifts. But with my financial worries eased, I was able to focus more on what I really loved, learning how to teach. As the semester ended, I started applying for teaching positions, each application sent with a mix of hope and nerves. One afternoon, while I was setting up for a job fair, my old classmate, Sarah, bumped into me. Listen, are you still looking for a job? My aunt's school is looking for a new primary teacher. You should totally apply. I followed up on Sarah's tip and landed an interview. The night before, I practiced answers to possible questions in front of my mirror, determined to come off as confident and competent. The principal, Mr. Davis, was a stern-looking man who softened a bit as we talked. Why do you want to work with children, he asked, peering at me over his glasses. Because I believe every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists they become the best they can possibly be. I walked out of there feeling like I had just won my second scholarship. A week later, I got the call, I was in. I was going to be a teacher. After years of working tirelessly as a teacher and constantly hitting the books at night to stay ahead, I decided it was high time to invest in a proper laptop. Walking into the tech store, I was more than a little out of my element. Rows of shiny, high-tech gadgets lined the walls, each one promising the world. I must have looked lost because a guy with a friendly smile and a name tag that read, Tom, approached me. Need some help finding something? He asked, his tone friendly. Yeah, I'm looking for a laptop that can handle a lot of multitasking and won't give up on me in a year. I replied, hoping I sounded like I knew what I was talking about. Tom nodded, showing me a few models and explaining the specs in a way that didn't go right over my head. This one here would be perfect for what you need, and it's within budget. As he rang up the sale, he gave a casual, you know, you seem really into your work. If you ever need tech advice, or any advice, really, here's my number. We started texting, casual at first, then daily. Dates followed, easy nights out where the laughter flowed as freely as the conversation. But whenever things edged towards serious, Tom was quick with the breaks. We're still young, Anna. There's no rush, he'd say, every time I hinted at something deeper. I didn't push it. I was busy enough, and having someone even just to laugh with felt like a win. But then, one lazy Saturday morning, as I was enjoying my coffee and the rare chance to sleep in, my phone rang. 
It was mom, which was unusual enough to spike my heartbeat. Anna, it's your dad. He's really sick. You should come. The weight in her voice pulled me upright. I'm on my way. Tom, sprawled on the couch, sat up. Everything okay? It's my dad. I have to go see him. He's sick. I'll come with you. He offered, and something in his tone made it clear he wasn't asking. We drove in silence, the tension thick. As we pulled up to the family house, his whistle cut through the quiet. Damn, Anna, you didn't say you grew up in a mansion. It's not as glamorous as it looks, I murmured, my stomach nodding up as we walked to the door. Inside, Mom and Emily were the picture of superficial concern. I introduced Tom, their smiles a little too polished. Nice to finally meet the man making our Anna so happy. Mom cooed, her eyes appraising. We were just talking about the future, Emily chimed in, eyeing Tom like a new accessory she might like to try. I barely listened, my focus on getting to dad. He was propped up in bed, looking so frail it knocked the breath from me. Anna, my girl, he rasped as I approached. I'm sorry, for everything. Tears stung my eyes, but I managed to smile. It's okay, dad. I'm here now. I should have been stronger. Should have stood up for you more. He continued, each word labored. We talked a little more until he drifted off, tired from the effort. I kissed his forehead and joined the others at dinner, Tom in tow. The conversation at the table turned quickly to money, inheritances, things that seemed so trivial with dad's room just upstairs. Your father's made some smart investments, mom was saying, her voice light, almost excited. It should keep us comfortable. Yeah, I've been looking at trips to Europe, Emily added, like she was picking out items from a catalog. Tom listened, nodding along, but I felt sick. Shouldn't we focus on dad's health first? I interjected, unable to keep the edge from my voice. Oh, Anna, always so dramatic, Emily sighed. We have to be practical about the future. I wanted to argue, to scream that they were talking about dad like he was already gone. But I bit my tongue, the words tasting like bile. We drove back to my place, the city lights blurring past as I let the distance from that house, from those people, slowly help me breathe easier. Coming back from that unsettling dinner at my parents' place, Tom seemed more contemplative than usual. We'd barely closed the door to my apartment when he turned to me, his expression serious. Anna, I've been thinking a lot lately, he began, running a hand through his hair. Marry me, Anna. The proposal was as unexpected as a thunderclap in clear skies. What? Tom, where is this coming from? I know it's sudden, he admitted, stepping closer. But today, seeing everything. I just know I want to be there for you, for good. We don't need anything big, just us, together. His words, sincere and raw, cut through the confusion. I loved him, that much was clear. And maybe, just maybe, he was the solid thing I could hold on to. Okay, yes, I said, the decision feeling right despite the chaos of my thoughts. We didn't wait. The very next week, we stood together at City Hall, exchanging simple vows in a quiet room. No frills, no grand speeches, just a promise to each other. But even the warmth of new marriage couldn't shield me from the concern for my father. His health was deteriorating, each visit painting a starker picture than the last. One afternoon, as I sat beside his bed, holding his hand while he dozed, he stirred and looked at me with a clarity that had become rare. Anna, he murmured, squeezing my hand. When I'm gone, there'll be something for you. A surprise. I brushed his hair back from his forehead, smiling to ease his worries. Dad, don't talk like that. You need to focus on getting better. But he shook his head gently. Just, know that I did what I could. His words hung between us, heavy and somber. I chose not to press him, thinking it was the illness speaking, his mind fogged by medication and pain. Leaving his room that day felt harder than ever. At home, Tom tried to comfort me, but the image of my father's frail form haunted me. Meanwhile, Mom and Emily's conversations about the future grew more frequent and filled with cold calculations. 
One evening, I overheard them talking in the kitchen while I was supposed to be out. The medical bills are piling up, and with your father like this. Well, it's not sustainable. Mom was saying, her voice laced with impatience. I've already signed up for plastic surgery to find a new boyfriend. Emily responded, her tone just as calculating. We need to think about what comes next. I want that new car that you and I saw in the salon. Frustrated and heartbroken, I left them to their scheming. Back at my place, Tom held me close as I cried, my tears for my father, for the family I wished I had. The day we buried my father was cold and gray, the sky mourning with us as friends and relatives came to pay their respects. That evening, the family gathered at my parents' house. The air was thick with tension, everyone too aware of the elephant in the room, the inheritance. I was emotionally drained and wanted nothing more than to honor my father's memory in peace, but that wasn't to be. Tom was the first to break the silence about the will. So, what's going to happen now with the inheritance? We need to know what we're dealing with here, he said, his tone a bit too casual for the occasion. I shot him a look, my heart sinking. Tom, can we not do this right now? Today isn't about money. But he pressed on, oblivious or indifferent to my discomfort. I'm just saying, it's important. I mean, shouldn't the house go to Anna? It's only fair. My mother, who had been quietly listening, laughed dryly. Fair? This house has always belonged to Emily and me. You two were just, passing through. Tom's face hardened, and he turned to my sister. Emily, you know this isn't right. Anna deserves her share. Emily, looking more interested than she had all evening, fluttered her eyelashes at Tom. Oh, Tom, you always think of others. But mom's right, as usual. The conversation spiraled, voices raised in a bitter symphony. I felt sick listening to them, the words melding into a cacophony of greed. How could a day of mourning turn so quickly into a scramble for wealth? As they argued, Tom's attitude shifted, his earlier support for me fading as he began to compliment Emily on her sensible outlook. Watching him sidle up to my sister, something in me snapped. I couldn't stomach another minute of it. I fled to my father's room, the one place that still held traces of his presence, and collapsed into a restless sleep. The next morning, I awoke to the smell of coffee and found Tom in the kitchen. His expression was grave, a stark contrast to the light banter of just days before. Anna, we need to talk, he began, avoiding my gaze. I'm in love with Emily. I think she and I have a future together. The room spun a little, his declaration landing like a physical blow. You're what? Tom, are you serious? Before he could answer, I called Emily and mom to join us. Emily came down, looking smug while mom watched with a curious eye. I just wanted you to hear it from me first, Emily said, her tone infuriatingly calm. I'm a decent person, Anna. I didn't want to go behind your back. Mom nodded, her approval evident. It's very noble of you, Emily. To be so upfront about this. Their words, their betrayal, it was too much. I felt a cold, hard calm settle over me. You all deserve each other, I said quietly. Tom extended the divorce papers toward me, a pen poised. Without hesitation, I signed, each stroke of my name severing the ties that bound us. You'll get your things through a courier. Don't come back. With that, I walked out of the kitchen, out of the house, and didn't look back. I was free now, and with that freedom, a new path lay open. A path I would walk alone, but at least it was mine, honest and unencumbered. Two weeks later, we all got back together in the notary's sterile office, about to hear the reading of my father's will. The air was tense, thick with unspoken accusations and bitter expectations. Mom and Emily were chatting in hushed, anxious tones, while Tom looked uncomfortable, shifting in his seat next to Emily. The notary, Mr. Clarkson, a severe-looking man with glasses perched on the tip of his nose, cleared his throat and began reading the will. I sat there, my hands folded in my lap, bracing for whatever came next. To my daughter Anna, Mr. Clarkson read, his voice neutral. I leave the sum of $400,000.
The room went silent for a heartbeat before chaos erupted. Mom's face turned a shade of red I knew too well as her financial desperation spilled out. I have debts, Anna. Your father knew. He promised he'd take care of us. She shrieked, her voice cracking under the strain. Emily joined in, her voice sharp and accusing. And what about me? I'm getting married to Tom. We need that money for a proper wedding. You don't need all that money, Anna. I stared at them, the sheer audacity rendering me momentarily speechless. Tom, meanwhile, tried to play the affection card, stepping toward me with open arms. I've missed you, Anna. I've made a mistake. I only ever loved you. Before he could reach me, Emily yanked him back by the shirt, her eyes wide with betrayal. Tom, what are you doing? He tried to wriggle free from her grasp, but Emily's grip was tight, her nails practically digging into his skin. Enough, Mr. Clarkson's voice boomed through the room, louder than I'd ever heard. If you cannot behave in a civilized manner, I will have to ask you to leave. And if necessary, I will call the police. The threat of authority seemed to pierce through the chaos, bringing a sudden, sullen silence to the room. Mom and Emily, with crocodile tears streaming down their faces, turned to me once more. Anna, please, my mother begged, her voice softening to a manipulative whisper. Think of your family. Emily, still clinging to Tom, echoed her plea. We're your family, Anna. Don't we mean anything to you? Looking at them, at their false tears and desperate faces, something inside me hardened. These were not the actions of a family, they were the actions of vultures dressed in familiar skins. No, I said firmly, my voice steady, despite the shaking of my hands. This money is what Dad wanted me to have. He knew I would use it wisely, not squander it on debts or lavish weddings. Tom, Emily, and Mom stared back, a mixture of shock and indignation written across their faces. You'll regret this, Anna. You won't be happy with this money. Mom hissed as I turned to leave. Maybe, I replied, pausing at the door. But I'd rather find that out on my own, without any of you. As I stepped into the sunlight, the cool air felt like the first breath of a new life, one where I was no longer bound by the toxic ties of those who shared my blood but not my values. I used the money to open a small private kindergarten. It was something I'd dreamed of, a place where children could feel loved and valued, the way I wished I had felt growing up. The process wasn't easy. There were permits to obtain, a property to renovate, curriculums to design, and staff to hire. But every step felt right. I named it Bright Beginnings, a nod to the new start it represented for me and the children we would serve. Business was good, better than I had hoped. Parents loved our approach, and word of mouth spread. Soon, we were at full capacity, and I began planning an expansion. One day, while reviewing blueprints with my assistant, Jenny, my phone buzzed with an update from a name I hadn't seen in a while, Rachel, a mutual acquaintance of my family. Hey Anna, thought you should know, your mom and Emily sold the house. They had to move out of town, ended up in a small place. Not much left after settling their debts. She texted. I stared at the screen for a long moment. Thanks for the update, Rachel. I typed back, a mix of emotions swirling through me. As the days turned into weeks, Bright Beginnings grew not just in size, but in reputation. It was during this busy time that Tom reappeared, as unexpectedly as he had exited my life. I was returning from a meeting when I found him standing outside my apartment, a huge bouquet in his hands and that same charming smile plastered on his face. Anna, hey! I've been thinking about you," he said as I approached, trying to hand me the flowers. I stopped short, my keys in my hand, an incredulous laugh escaping me. Really, Tom? After everything, you think flowers will fix it? Come on, Anna. I made a mistake. Can we talk? His voice was coaxing, his smile faltering just a bit. I looked at him, really looked at him, and all I saw was the same selfishness, the same opportunism. No, Tom. We can't. There's nothing for you here. He lingered for a moment, the smile finally slipping off his face as he realized I was serious. Then, with nowhere left to push, he turned and left, the discarded flowers lying wilted by my doorstep. 
The next few months flew by. Bright Beginnings became not just a daycare, but a cornerstone of the community. We hosted family events, workshops for parents, and continued to expand our services. As I watched the children play in the newly added outdoor play area, their laughter ringing clear and true, I felt a sense of accomplishment and peace. I had built something lasting, something meaningful.